Hello, this is Jared Niemi with a mini lecture on case statistics in regression. All right, so we use the phrase case statistics here, and case really refers to an observation. So previously, we've talked about other statistics within the context of regression. For example, the uh, estimates of regression coefficients. Those are uh, statistics. This time, what's of interest are statistics that tell us something about uh, the uh, observations of our data set. So in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, statistics that talk about how influential the data points can be to the overall regression. So do they change the model much when they're included versus when they're not? And the other type of uh, statistics we're going to be talking about are the residuals. So we've talked about these before. Residuals are actually uh, statistics that are associated with a particular observation. And today we're going to be talking about how to create standardized residuals and then how to interpret those residuals. All right, so the first thing is talking about these case statistics involved with how influential your observations are in your data set. So we're going to be talking about two statistics. The first is leverage, and the second is Cook's D. So leverage here is just a measure of the distance between an observation's explanatory variable values and the average of the explanatory variable values in the entire data set. All right, so if you, we'll see some pictures in a second, but notice that this is only a measure of the explanatory variables. This has nothing to do at this point with the response whatsoever. So this is just saying how close is that variable's uh, explanatory variable, that observation's explanatory variable values to the rest of the observation's explanatory variable values. If it's very close, then the leverage is going to be very low. If it's very far away from the average of the rest of the explanatory variable values, then it's going to be large. And so one question always comes up to it is how large is large uh, to be of concern that a point has high leverage? And so here's a general rule of thumb. There's no uh, hard and fast rule for what you'd use here, but a, a general rule would be uh, if the leverage is 2p over n, where p here is the number of regression coefficients and n is the number of observations. So if that's the case, then you might be concerned that this point ha might have an impact on your analysis. Or it might be telling you that maybe perhaps this observation is outside the scope of the analysis that you're trying to do. All right, and the second statistic that actually talks now about how influential observations are that are outside, um, that have typically those observations that have high leverage have the possibility of being influential. And Cook's distance measures the overall effect on the estimated regression coefficients when removing that observation. So that is, how much impact does that observation actually have on the, on the uh, regression coefficients? If there's very little impact when you remove that observation from the data set on the estimated regression coefficients, then Cook's distance will be low. If it has a large impact, then Cook's distance will be large. So the rule of thumb here is that when Cook's distance gets around 1 or certainly above 1, then you should be concerned that that observation is having a large overall impact on the estimated regression coefficients. Now with that being said, there might be only one particular uh, parameter or one particular coefficient that you're interested in for your scientific study, and it may be that the observation has very little impact on that particular coefficient, and maybe it's impacting other coefficients. And so the, the idea here is that if you have an observation that has a large Cook's distance, what you're going to want to do is, is fit the model with and without it and see if it has an impact on the scientific conclusions that you would draw from that data set. <clears throat> All right, so here's a, a picture of what's going on with leverage and Cook's distance. There are four different pictures here. On each of the pictures, I'm plotting the response variable on the y-axis and the explanatory variable on the x-axis. And these four different pictures are going to go through basically the different combinations of having uh, high and low leverage and having high and low Cook's distance, or equivalently, influence. So if we start here in the top left, in the top left, oh, I guess I should say, in each plot, the solid line is the line with all of the data points. So that is all of the solid filled data points as well as the open circle. The red dashed line is the line when you remove 
that open circle data point. All right, so the first thing is in this top left picture is to look at where, right, remember that the x-axis is our explanatory variable, and the question is to look at where this observation is relative to the other values on the x-axis because those other values in the x-axis are where the rest of our data are. And notice this point, this open circle point, falls basically right in the middle of all of the rest of our observations as far as the x-axis is concerned. And when that's the case, the observation will have low leverage. So in this case, leverage here is 0.05. Uh, this is a model with only two, uh, well, we're really one estimated regression coefficient, and there are 20 observations. So the expected uh, leverage is about 0.05, and that's what we see here. So there's sort of nothing unusual going on as far as leverage is concerned. Then Cooks D says, well, how much, since this is simple linear regression, how much does the line change when you take that data point out? So in this case, notice that the solid black line and the red dashed line are right on top of each other. So the line basically hasn't moved at all, even when we remove that observation and therefore Cook's distance is going to be small. In this case, it's going to be zero. All right, so that's the first plot. This is a plot of an observation here that has both low leverage and low Cook's distance. If we move to the right plot, well, now if we compare the values on the x-axis, here's the range of values on the x-axis for the rest of our observations. And this observation that we're interested in is very far away from the mean of the rest of the observations. And so this observation is going to have high leverage. Leverage here is 0.42. Uh, our cutoff here is somewhere around uh, 1 of 10, so right around 0.1, so anything above 0.1 we might be concerned about. Um, and so notice that this has a very high leverage relative to that cutoff of 0.1. So that may be concerning, but then we'll want to look at how influential that point is for the question of interest, the question of interest here would be this regression line. So notice here the black solid line again is with all the data points and the red dashed line is with all the data points except for the open circle point. And these lines are not exactly right on top of each other but very, very similar. And so the line is not changing much and that then corresponds to a very low Cook's distance. All right, remember Cook's distance around 1 is what we're going to start getting to be concerned. So 0.05 is pretty small relative to that cutoff. All right, so then we'll move down to the bottom left plot here. And again, we're going to first look at the uh, x-axis and say, well, how far away from the average uh, of the black dots is the open circle? And notice it's basically right in the middle. So again, it's going to have low leverage. So here's the low leverage. It's exactly the same as the plot above it. And that's because these data points are exactly in the same spot on the x-axis. All right, but now it no longer is the line exactly where it was before, right? Unlike the top plot, the line has actually moved a bit. So this plot, this data point here, is not very far away on the x-axis, but it's pretty far away on the y-axis from the rest of our observations. And yet, it has a very hard time of actually moving this line much. So Cook's distance here isn't, although it's bigger than the Cook's distance we've seen so far, is not very big. Right? It's not getting close to this cutoff of 1 uh, that we are starting to be concerned about. So this is why on the, on the y-axis label here, I have high in question mark influence. The point here in this plot is that it's very hard for an observation that has low leverage to have high Cook's distance. If you have low leverage, it's hard for you to have a huge impact on the line for simple linear regression or um, the model in a multiple regression framework. In contrast, if we come over to the left or the right side here, now again we're looking first on the uh, x-axis and we'll notice that our open circle here is very far away from the rest of our points on the x-axis and so it has high leverage, just like we had high leverage up here. But now this uh, adding, putting this data point in or taking it out of the model has a big impact on the regression line. Notice that the black solid line is the line when we have that point in it, and the red dashed line is the line when we have that point out. And here the Cook's distance is uh, above 4, so very far above this cutoff of 1. 
And so this data point here has both high leverage because its x its explanatory variable is very far away from the rest of the data, but it also has very high leverage because it has a very big impact on the regression line. Sorry, it has very big influence as measured by Cook's D because the regression line changes quite a bit. Now this is the illustration for simple linear regression. Uh, it's hard to make illustrations for multiple regression because there's just more uh, there's more dimensions to be looking at. Uh, but the same idea holds for multiple regression. And for multiple regression, then the uh, leverage will say how far is the explanatory variable values for that observation away from the rest of the explanatory variable values for the other observations. But Cook's D says, well, how much does removing that observation, what kind of impact does that have on the model itself, on all the estimated regression coefficients? All right, so leverage. Yes, it's just how far away the explanatory variable values are. Cook's D is a measure of how influential those points are. All right, so now we move on to resi residuals, the second half of this mini lecture. And residuals are another case statistic. They're a statistic particular to an observation. Uh, recall we've talked about residuals before, and we've talked about these uh, residuals where we just take the actual observed data and subtract off the fitted data. That is, after we fit the model, we can say, what, what would the data have been if it had fit the model perfectly? And that's going to be our residual. So we use uh, residual plots to look for things like non-constant variance or uh, non-linearity, these kinds of things. Uh, but it was hard to think about uh, residual being too big or too small. Right? It wasn't clear when a residual should be too big or too small. And so what we're going to do now is try to standardize these residuals so that we have a, a frame of reference for saying how big is too big and how tall, small is too small. So the first standardization uh, we're going to call uh, studentized residuals or internally studentized residuals. Some just call this standardization. And the idea here is that we're going to take our residual and divide by the standard deviation of that residual. Uh, it's given by this formula, where this formula here is the estimated uh, the estimated uh, variance or standard deviation from our model, right? So this is the square root of the mean squared error from the model. H here is actually the leverage. Right? So there's a relationship between the residuals and the leverage. It turns out that this is at least an estimate of the standard deviation of that residual. And so we can take our residual and divide by that standard deviation. And now our residuals should have approximately a standard normal distribution. That is, they should be normally distributed with mean 0 and variance 1. What this means is that 95% of our observations should be between minus 2 and plus 2. And so now we have a scale to actually compare our residuals on. We're going to then have another uh, type of standardization. This one is called externally st studentized residuals. And the idea here is to do exactly what we did before, but now we're replacing with the uh, estimate of the root mean squared error by the version that we would get had we removed that observation from the model and refit the whole model. Right? But again, the idea here is going to be that the, this version also has a standard normal distribution. Right? And the key here is that once we know that it has a standard normal distribution, or at least approximately, then we know that about 95% of the residuals should be between minus 2 and 2. And we can then talk about if a residual is too big or too small. So here's a picture from, this happens to be the, a case study from chapter 12 in the statistical sleuth. I believe it's the first case study yep, of the SAT scores. And so we have in the very top plot, we have the raw residuals. On the x-axis, we have just the, um, the observation number. And it, this happens to actually correspond to the uh, the highest SAT scores in the group down to the lowest SAT scores in the group. Uh, a convenient aspect of the actual residuals is that we can uh, interpret the residual on the actual scale of the data. So for instance, there's the very first observation that after we've accounted for percent of individuals taking the exam and the median class rank, uh, this state has uh, about, what, uh, SA get it on average, SAT score is about 48 points higher than would be expected by the model. Whereas this state down here 
gets SAT scores uh, about uh, 90 points below what would have get, been expected from the model. All right, but again, now looking at this picture, it's hard to tell uh, if these observations uh, that are far away from zero are sort of too far in any sense. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do the studentized residual or the externally studentized residual. And these two end up looking fairly similar uh, in this case and in, in many cases. And now we're going to be saying, all right, we had 50 states. If about 95% of points should be outside of the lines, then with 50 points, we should expect about 2.5 points to be outside the line. And we can see here that certainly there's one point outside the line, and then there's maybe two, three, four that are possibly outside the line. And now with that being said, this point down here is pretty far away from the line. With the standard normal, you'd only expect about 99% of your observations to be plus or minus, uh, outside of plus or minus three. And this one right here looks to be about minus three. So this seems to be an observation where the data, the model is certainly not fitting uh, that observation very well because of the high residual. All right, so let's take this same example and we're going to just show what the SAS has for its standard diagnostics. Right, we've talked about a number of these plots before. We've talked about QQ plots and about residuals versus predicted values. Uh, but now we hadn't talked at all about these three plots. And now that we've talked about leverage and Cook's D and residuals, uh, studentized residuals, we can talk a bit more about these particular figures. So this top middle figure here is the studentized residual versus the predicted values. And it, the lines here are drawn for your reference to, to denote the uh, plus or minus 2 threshold. And so we know, again, that 95% of the points uh, on average will be outside those lines. And so we do see some residuals that are outside the lines. And notice this one is uh, pretty far away from the line. So something uh, interesting is going on there. Uh, the next plot over here is, again, the studentized residuals on the y-axis versus the leverage on the x-axis. Here there appears to be a reference line. Um, that uh, looks to be, right, so it's somewhere around that 2p over n. Uh, here, p may be uh, 3. Yes. Okay. I guess, or p would be 2, and I think that would get you about to there. And so this is trying to tell you that these points have sort of high leverage. And again, what leverage means is that the explanatory variable values for that observation are sort of far away from the rest. And so those points may have the ability to be highly influential in the regression. And so we come down then to the next plot. This is Cook's distance versus the observation number. And remember that Cook's distances around 1 is where we're going to uh, certainly be concerned that it's having a large impact on our regression. And there's not really any observations that are anywhere close to being around 1. So in this case, it, it does not, we could try, we could try taking the data points out and putting them back in and see if anything substantially changes. But this is telling us that things will not substantially change. All right, so just to recap, that leverage essentially identifies observations that might be influential for the regression. And Cook's D actually says whether they had an overall large impact on the regression. And if there are points that do have a large impact, then what is a good approach is to fit the model with and without those observations and then see if they change the impact on the questions of interest the scientific questions of interest that you have. If they don't, then great. You can just go ahead and keep them in the model and report the results. Uh, if they do, then you have to make a decision. Either you bo report both results uh, or, or tell people why you threw the points out. Of course, the rationale is that they don't fit the model well. is probably not a very good rationale. All right, then finally, the uh, residuals are observations. I guess I misspelled observations every time on this uh, slide. Uh, the observations, uh, the residuals describe when the observations are not being sort of accurately uh, fit by the model. It doesn't tell you what to do about that. It just tells you that you might want to investigate those observations more. Uh, you might go back to a lab notebook and see if you've actually transferred the data appropriately, that kind of thing. All right, thank you.